This is Connie Bostic. It's October 3rd, 2008. We're in the home of Linda and Ron Larson in Woodburn, North Carolina with Vera Williams. Vera, would you tell us a little bit about your early life and how you came to be a student at Black Mountain College? Uh, yes, I would like to do that, Connie. I was thinking about it while listening to uh, my longtime uh, friend from uh, Black Mountain, Patsy. And uh, it was very moving to hear another student so, uh, and her tell about her background. Mine was so different. I grew up in New York City. Uh, my parents were both uh, radicals. Uh, I don't know exactly what to call them. They were uh, certainly in the direction of communists. They also had an anarchist uh, component. They were very interested in progressive education. Uh, they were vegetarian for a while. They were uh, doers in the community, and uh, and they were strugglers through the Depression. Uh, I was born in 1927, and lived my early my childhood through the Great Depression. Uh, hopefully, not about to return. Um, so, uh, in my route to Black Mountain was very different, uh, and and yet it was very odd. Very odd. I went to music and art high school in New York. It was a public high school started by Mayor LaGuardia, and uh, we thought we were just the cat's meow, you know, all these music and art children from the various boroughs. And uh, I uh, took a great, I was an art student, a visual art student. I took a great interest uh, in the great books. A brother of a friend of mine taught, had gone to St. John's and taught there. So when he would come back to New York City, he would do sessions with us. So we actually were trying to follow some of the program of the college in Annapolis. And I wanted to go there. So I applied. And they said, no, we don't take girls. We're very sorry. I kept trying. And I said, well, I want, we, they said, we don't have dormitories. I, it's all right. I said, I'll live in town. You know, no, that couldn't be done. But they said, why don't you go to Black Mountain College? Uh, where you can study whatever you want. And one of their people, I can't remember his name, um, but he taught a philosophy course at Black Mountain, as well as taught at St. John's. He, I guess he came down maybe maybe once a week, maybe not that often, probably. Uh, anyway, they encouraged me to do that. And at the same time, I had some knowledge of the college through the art people at, uh, at high school. And so... Uh, I, I applied in order to go to college at all. I had to get a grant, uh, which uh, I got from the Educational Foundation for Jewish Girls, who also sent my sister to Tyler School of Fine Art. I mean, she applied and they paid. They sent my mother to nursing school. Um, they're a wonderful organization. And uh, once I got in, they didn't question what kind of college it was or anything. I uh, got in and I got my fee reductions, which Black Mountain made exclusive of your scholarship or anything, and I was enabled to go. They gave me $500 a year. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then I worked in the summers uh, for the extra money, and uh, it was very hard for my parents to send me any, but they did send me a little uh, along the way. Can you talk a little bit about what you studied at Black Mountain and who you studied with? Oh yes, yes. Um, I I was very eager to do almost everything there was to be done. I, I, uh, I came uh, full of enthusiasm. Uh, I, I early on lost my interest in following the St. John's program, not because I wasn't interested in the subject matter, but there was such a active, vibrant life at the school, and I had been an art student really since childhood. I had gone to a special art school, uh, uh, experimental uh, art teacher uh, on Saturday mornings, as well as I had gone to painting classes uh, through the WPA at, uh, at uh, Settlement House in the Bronx, the Bronx House, uh, which I consider was where I was educated rather. I did go to public school, but my education also went on after three o'clock at the Bronx House, uh, which was a place where you could do art and music and, uh, and athletics and outings and all kinds of things like that. Uh, and I also, in high school, had gone to uh, 
dance, modern dance, uh, after school at uh, the New Dance Group in New York. Uh, of course, New York, everything was, oh, lots of things were free or very inexpensive then to do. Um, so I was very eager to do everything when I got there. And, you know, I, I have come to realize that I also had a kind of a almost literary, romantic uh, connection to uh, a certain kind of education and also the fact that there was a farm there. And I too was a milk, a milk room person. That's like the best kind of job to me. And I think that was because of having loved Heidi as a child. So the idea was, it, it is odd how these things develop. You, you think you choose them in this very rational way, but I had this, uh, uh, you know, vision of, of uh, being able to deal with the milk and the butter and so forth, which I did. I loved it. I, I did the morning milk room, lifted those heavy cans, <laughs> and learned to make butter and cheese and lived on heavy cream, which was an ambition <laughs> from childhood, because <laughs> uh, I had charge of the cream. Um, I studied, I took uh, drawing, painting, weaving, um, but I also took, uh, I took uh, a course in the Bible, um, which was, had a, uh, I think, uh, I had a chance to think deeply about uh, kinds of things. We read the first uh, books of the Old Testament. I was raised in a, in a non-religious, almost anti-religious home. And uh, so that was the thinking about my, and I am Jewish, but I was, I was raised with secular Judaism, mm -hmm. uh, to which my parents, my parents were not renouncers of Judaism, but we were not religious. I actually went to Jewish school as a child after school. Um, so I was very interested in that, and I, I believe that was taught by uh, Edward Lewinsky even though that was not his field. But uh, the school, um, uh, previous year, they had undertaken, uh, one, of, one of the te faculty had undertaken to teach Moby Dick and discovered this ignorance of the Bible among the students. So it was thought that would be a good thing to teach. I may, I may misremember who taught that, but uh, I think it was um, Eddie. Uh, what else did I study? Uh, I had to, I think, do some remedial math uh, work in order to be prepared to go into senior division. School was divided into junior and senior division, and uh, uh, you had to be clearly able in certain areas to go on to senior division and concentrate. Uh, I took. Did I mention weaving? Yes, I took weaving. Thread and string drives me crazy, but uh, but I loved the interaction of the colors and everything. Um, I think the drawing class was marvelous. I learned to we learned to do Bodoni lettering, which has affected me a lot. We learned so much that I have used all my life. Um, I took uh, there was nobody who taught. Um, Printing actually, but uh, a few of the students revived this uh, abandoned print shop, and we activated the presses. And then after the war, we got a new press from the government, and uh, I did a lot of that. So you worked in the print Maybe shop. Maybe should hold one second for that audio to stop. So you studied weaving with Annie Albers, and um, you took drawing and painting classes with Joseph Albers. Yes, I took drawing and painting with jo drawing painting and des design and color. I took all four um, things that, that he, all four subjects that he, I don't even call them subjects, uh, areas of art that he taught. And then uh, when I worked toward my graduation, he was my uh, guide that I worked with. My uh, What was he like as a teacher? Uh, he was a unique experience. He, I had no relativeness to what you would learn uh, in, about the psychology of teaching or anything like that. He, uh, he uh, treated people unequally, he uh, was dismissive, uh, he was, 
heavy duty. Uh, I remember him getting a student to, <laughs> this is hard, we had a model and uh, there was a student who wasn't an art student but he wanted to draw, right? And he drew things that looked a little bit shaggy. And, and uh, he, I remember him at asking this student, a young man, to come up by the model and, uh, you know, certainly touch her with his eyes, you know, and say, look at this, you know, wonderful young woman here, you know, and then the kid was so embarrassed, you know, and all he did things like that, but he was brilliant. And he cared enormously about you learning. He may not have cared about you in some sensitive way, though he, though he had that aspect sometimes too, but he cared about his subject. He was just a powerful person with a great pedagogical imagination. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's not very usual to encounter. He was a great artist, a colorist, uh, and yet he taught a very, uh, I don't know about traditional, but a very specific uh, attention-paying kind of course in drawing, probably one of the best you could get, uh, where you really got to look at what was in front of you, you know. And uh, then we always all put our drawings down. This was downstairs in the study building and uh, criticized them together. I remember him. We weren't to have a big piece of paper with a little drawing on it that you could tack up and exhibit. No, we would have covered the whole thing with, with you know, drawing. We weren't to show off. We were to learn. And that was wonderful. It was wonderful. Um, and it was just very imaginative. Um, and he cared about the visual aspect of everything to the extent in which you might say it was a sort of a, um, aesthetic autocracy, what color anything could be painted, what lettering could be used on uh, all the college were, you know, because from the Bauhaus there was this attention to every aspect of modernism uh, in printing, in you know, even if you didn't have much choice because the college was limited in funds, but in the choice of uh, the, the, the tableware, uh, everything was thought about, you know. And that, that is uh, such an important part of being an artist, I think. And it applies to so much, such a large areas of life. That was a big thing I learned there. Um, what about other classes, um, the classes in subjects like mathematics? You said that you had a little problem there. Yeah, and that was never a big interest of mine. Uh, it was a, I think mostly I did that just to develop enough mm -hmm. to go on. But I was very interested in, uh, in I read a lot, I had always read a lot. I wrote uh, just for myself. I don't remember taking any kind of a class in, in free writing or poetry, but I was very interested in all of that. I wrote stories, I wrote poems. Um, I really have a, a kind of a not very good memory of other th things that I took. I think I took a course with Edward Levy in uh, 20th Century Philosophers, because uh, I think we were going to read Marx, Bergson, Eddington, I forget who else. So I did that. I don't think I completed that, but uh, I, I was immersed in that. And then I came from a very uh, political, in the best, I think, very uh, broad sense uh, background, in which it was assumed in my life as a child that uh, you were very interested in what went on in the world, that you were responsible, uh, that things didn't just happen to you, that you participated in change. That, that's, I, I never said it that way, but you participated in change. In our neighborhood, for instance, uh, in our neighborhoods, we moved a great deal when I was a child because we couldn't pay the rent. Uh, but uh, wherever we lived were people struggling to pay the rent and being kicked out of their apartments. And my parents, uh, along with other uh, leftists in the neighborhood, would form groups and carry when the bailiff came took the furniture out, they carried the furniture back in. Uh, I remember going to demonstrations for penny milk. 
uh, penny milk was proposed for children who were deprived of nourishment, you know, and milk was being poured down the drains all over the country on farms and all, uh, in order to keep the price up. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was thought, well, we could have penny milk, and we all went to protest and try to get penny milk. But it was it was just part of our life as children. We were very interested in the pursuit of the loyalist victory in Spain. I remember standing on a corner with a tin can to collect money for Spain, and and it was it was all just part of life. It, we were enthusiastic activists, and that carried over very much. Uh, uh, into life at Black Mountain College. The students helped run the college. Students tried to raise money. Sometimes this college closed early uh, for Christmas vacation because we had to have mo more money to, for coal and things like that. Um, of course, we had to, during the war, we had to go and shovel our own coal. I think there's a picture of me shoveling coal out of a boxcar. Um, I was very enthusiastic about all that. All of it, I think. So the work problem was really an important thing to you. Oh, I loved it, yeah. yeah. I remember working on the farm. Um, I remember painting the farmhouse and I'm making myself climb up on a ladder. You know, I'm scared, but I did it. Um, I remember I was uh, very, uh, Mary Gregory was my um, advisor. Everybody had a student advisor. She was, uh, she taught carpentry and all. I uh, learned to use the lathe. I made a broom closet. Uh, <laughs> it had very few right angles and it had to be racked into shape with great big clamps. Um, I, I was interested in the wood shop. Um, the, you know, I was interested in any, anything there was to, to do. <laughs> Who did you work with mostly in the print shop? Oh, who's, let's see. Jimmy, I, I won't be able to remember, but there were a few... Uh, young men who had come after the war, after the we got the GI Bill and all, and uh, they uh, had taken printing in in high school. You know that used right? Girls took cooking, boys took printing or carpentry, and so they knew enough to um, to revive. And I learned to set type. And for my graduation project, I did graduate, and my project was uh, in graphic arts. Even though we didn't have an etching workshop or anything like that, but I studied, uh, I, was, I was, oddly enough, I had always painted, as a child I had painted very colorfully and loved colorful um, uh, peasant art and all that I was exposed to. Uh, but uh, I became very drawn to black and white uh, and to the expressionists and to woodcuts and uh, uh, so it was possible to do that with our small means, you know. And so, as part of my um, uh, my project, I designed uh, as much of the college uh, print concert um, menus, that's not what they're called, but programs, programs mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, I invented signage for the different uh, events. Uh, I remember it was on the, it was an entertainment committee or something like that for making decorations for events. I did a lot of that. Um, I remember working with a student named Willie Joseph, who was a passionate weaver, and uh, um, we both uh, invented these, uh, the, like decorating. You didn't just get balloons. That was all connected. It grew out of design, you know, and your approach to color and to form and all of that. Um, oh, gosh, you know, when you th it was just wonderful, the, the way everything was connected, right? And then I was always very interested in food. I took a great interest in the kitchen. Um, and eventually, even after I graduated, myself and June Rice, we, we no longer had a dietitian uh, who made the menus and so forth. Uh, so we offered to, uh, we felt there was a certain lack of attention to nutrition or something. We were so arrogant, you know, these cooks struggled along to feed us and all, but we felt the string beans were overcooked and like that, you know, so, <laughs> but uh, that we would do, we would make the menus, <laughs> we didn't know what <laughs> we knew very little. <laughs> the first cook, turkey I ever cooked was one of five, you know, for Thanksgiving. They were all 
done properly on one side and undone on the other. So we carefully faced them with the good side out. <laughs> and the next, you know, further in the week, we ate the rest of them. But uh, that was a marvelous thing. You could, you could try anything, you know. Uh, in vacation, uh, we had too much milk, you know, and we didn't have a contract to sell it. Um, so uh, I, I don't know how I got this idea. Well, I, I had sent for publications from the government about milk and making cheese and all like that. And so uh, I found out you could make milk paint. So we made milk paint and painted the whole huge dining room with it. I think it was milk, uh, whiting, uh, lime, and something to keep it from smelling, turning sour and smelling nasty. And it was pretty runny kind of paint, but it covered. It was a kind of whitewash. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, here I was, you know, I was, what was I, 19 or something? I came from the city. <laughs> but I just did this. <laughs> and they let you, you know. They let you do things. They let you make mistakes. Um, and, uh, I mean, the whole a whole lot of progressive education in my experience, because I went on to be very interested in and start a school and and uh, uh, be a cook at a school uh, in a similar progressive tradition in Ontario, Canada, where we also had a farm. And uh, uh, the whole thing has to do with the balance between uh, how far you can go in unguided efforts, uh, you know, to make your own mistakes and learn that way. But in a in a supportive environment that won't let you, uh, you know, uh, do things that turn out to be dangerous or... So that's that's hard to know. It's hard to know when you bring up your children, too. Yeah, it is. It is. What about some of the people who came for the summer sessions while you were there? Yeah. Uh, th those were, of course, different than... The, especially before, uh, before the end of the war, because as Patsy said, it, it was a... A more sober, um, well, as sober isn't, I don't know if that's the right word, but it was smaller, it was confined, we were worried. There were very few, uh, the, uh, the sexuality that attends college life uh, and is important to it, uh, is important to the energy and the spirits of people and all, was damped down during that time. And then when the men returned and the the population increased and all, uh, it added to the life, you know. Um, but um, I think I've a little bit lost my train here. Uh, we were talking about the summer sessions? Yes, but the summer sessions always added new energy, right? And I, I couldn't afford to stay through every summer uh, because I, ha I had jobs as a camp counselor and in order just to get a chunk of change for coming, traveling down and all. Um, but uh, a couple of summers I did get to stay, and the people who influenced me greatly were uh, Merce Cunningham and John Cage, uh, and and the general. Uh, oh no, more than that, uh, Katie Litz, I think, who came to do dancing, and I was doing dancing with. I was very good friends with Elizabeth Betty Jenner John, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, she and her husband uh, Pete and myself and Paul Williams, we had learned to play the recorder there and uh, we had a little quartet and we played uh, we played baroque dances for uh, Merce Cunningham during the jig we just all broke out laughing we couldn't finish it <laughs> we were doing so badly <laughs> but uh, you know when, and none of us were music students so uh, uh, that was but Betty was very devoted to dance and uh, um, we all worked with Katie Litz uh, somebody came to do theater uh, and she put on uh, uh, the intellectual ladies. I don't. Uh, what is that in French? Uh, I forget. Uh, it's a tall woman. I don't remember her name. But uh, I designed the costumes for that, and I was in it. Um, I liked the theater very much. I did a little uh, puppet show that I invented under somebody's guidance. I don't. I know it was under somebody's guidance, but I don't remember it. In which I was the puppet. And I did a, a fairy tale that I had loved since childhood called Little One Eye, Two Eye, and Three Eyes. And I made a little tree with a silver apple. I mean, you could just put your, can you imagine? You could just put your imagination 
and to practice. It was like, it was very childlike in that way, you know. The, the, um, the imagination that children have if you let them pursue it and the playfulness, that was very much there in the middle of a lot of very serious struggle, you know. The struggles over whether we could try to do the beginnings of integration. Uh, while I was there, a, a group including Bayard Rustin and Jim Peck, uh, people who were actually badly beaten up eventually in the struggle to integrate interstate transportation, came and uh, talked and stayed overnight. Um, we met them. Um, the two, there were two farmers who uh, were uh, pacifists. Uh, this was their alternative service, Ray and uh, Treyer, and I forget the other one. Um, and there were these, uh, these visitors from, one of whom actually came to the college and stayed afterward, uh, Ralph Becker uh, from the CPS camp. So uh, all of that was going on along with this uh, uh, work of the imagination, play of the imagination, marvelous. <laughs> and after you left Black Mountain, you kept in touch with a lot of people who were there and established a community. Yes, we did. Uh, we became, uh, uh, my husband, I married. I, for I forgot to say that. <laughs> a very major step in life. I married while I was uh, at, at Black Mountain. We got married in the quiet house. Uh, Oh, I remember the night before, I remember getting my clothes ready, you know. I remember, you know, somebody saving me enough hot water for a bath because there was never enough hot water. We would all run down after the work program, you know, make sure we could get our bath in or get washed, you know. And But I remember getting ready and ironing my <laughs> skirt, which I think I made. Or somebody made it, but I had a, I had woven the fabric of my I wore a little vest, <laughs> and I had woven that, you know, and um, a minister we, we we had heard a minister speak on the radio, and he he had a certain pacifist component. We were not of any particular denomination, so we called him up and went to to talk with him, and he came out to perform the marriage in the in the quiet house, and then Dr. and uh, Mrs. Dane, who was visiting then, she didn't live there, uh, they made us a breakfast. And uh, then we went on back to work. <laughs> I remember even that Martinette Albers said, you, you really uh, don't have to work today. You should be working today. <laughs> I don't know if I get, did I, did I do justice to, to Joseph Albers? Because I did tell some of his his uh, uh, down, more autocratic sides and all, but I just really do want to stress that he was a magnificent uh, teacher. And, and I have used the things I've learned, I learned, literally learned, I remember learning them, uh, all, all my uh, artistic life, I really, I really have. And uh, I, I have a book called More, More, More Said the Baby. I'm a children's book writer and illustrator, and uh, a book of, of mine, uh, one, two of my books, one uh, called Ecot Honors, and one of them is very colorful. And uh, the uh, committee uh, head that chose me asked me if I had based it on color theory. And I hadn't based it on color theory precisely, but I had based it very much on my studies. I, I was very proud of that book because it employed so much of what I had literally learned in color classes, you know. And I'm not sure that you really, many people can say that about their education, that they understand exactly how, or not exactly, but they, they sense and can follow how the teaching that they went through and were exposed to and the projects they did and all led to their increasing abilities even many 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 years later because I didn't I didn't take up doing that until I was in my 40s oh. so, but we did to answer your question we did uh -huh. go uh, toward the quite messy end of Black Mountain College I have to say it rather fell apart the people imaginative interesting brilliant people were there but they did not have Albers and the earlier people's ability 
to uh, administrate. That was always a problem. It's always a problem in a place that where the administration is not separate from the ownership and the daily participation to keep something going. Uh, institutions provide a screen from all the struggles, right? And that we didn't have that. Every time there was a big struggle, people left and that sides were taken and like that. But at any rate, uh, near the end, we started to talk about what we would do next. And my husband, Paul Williams, was involved in the College of Thurs Money Went. Uh, which he had from his family, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, he had built buildings there. He was very interested in it. He had a basically pacifist Quaker nature, though he was not brought up that way, and a negotiating nature. So we tried to figure out where we could go next and do more. People wanted to be closer to New York. John Cage, Merce Cunningham was involved, particularly John Cage, Mary Carolyn Richards, um, who else from the college? David Tudor, uh, the Potters, the Wine Ribs. Uh, and uh, we moved uh, to New York. We then lived in the Boston area, and we moved down to New York City, and we spent six months looking for a piece of property, forming the bylaws of a new corporation. Uh, Patsy and Lanou then get in, got involved with it too, I don't know at what point. And we found a place 30 miles outside New York City in Rockland County called Stony Point. And we bought 116 acres and we started to build what actually turned out to be a residential community with a strong emphasis uh, on artists and craftspeople, though there were other people there, artists including musicians, and uh, greatly including musicians because there was the, uh, the early music uh, group um, that uh, um, Patsy was involved in and Lanou and then there was the John Cage people and they lived right across from each other that was exciting and um, then there was David Berman there were other musicians uh, of the um, of a, um, the whole group around John Cage and there was the pottery and uh, there was uh, an enamelist and um, and we were able to put a lot of our ideas about children raising and community up. Very much influence, we haven't mentioned Paul Goodman, who came in the summer, uh, was a highly uh, uh, argu argumentative person, a uh, uh, polarizing person, but full of ideas, in very interesting ideas about that are now so much talked about how we could have a both an urban and a country life, uh, how we could be a community. He and his brother wrote a book called Communitas. Uh, we took courses with him, Paul and myself, and uh, I mean, he talked about things like how the chairs were arranged in a meeting and what it meant, or in a, in a, in a church, you know? If the chairs were all this way and we were all focused on somebody, or if the chairs were around, you know? It, it just made you think about where should the houses be? How should they face each other? What does this mean in terms of how people will talk to each other and so forth? So, and uh, Paul was very influenced by that, and I was too. And uh, that all led into the community. And then Paul Goodman was on the uh, advisory board for our, uh, not for the community, didn't have that, but I think for our school, which we later started, a very disorderly elementary school. But it had many wonderful things went on in it. This is too much to talk about. <laughs> Look how old I am. I mean, <laughs> we've just been doing things for decades. <laughs> so, from from Black Mountain, then the people who went to the land were M. C. Richards, M. C. Richards, David, David Tudor, Tudor uh, Karen Carnes, David yeah. Weinrib, uh, Patsy uh, Lynch Davenport, mm -hmm. and Lanou Davenport. Uh, that's all I can think of. Other people thought of coming. Mm -hmm. Merce Cunningham did not want, want. Did I mention John Cage? You mentioned John. Yeah. John Cage and I built a stone wall together. He lived on one. We shared a building. And uh, 
and <laughs> neither of us had ever built a stone wall. Uh, we started with small, we lived in Stony Point in Rockland County. We lived on the side of a hill of stones, and so we didn't have to go very far to get them, but we started with smallish stones. And as time went on, I was pregnant, uh, going toward, you know, the birth of the baby. He was about to go on tour, uh, you know, and the, the stones got bigger. <laughs> we got about two feet from the ceiling. Uh, that was the end of the wall, so it ended in cupboards between his area and ours. I think he could hear every word we said uh, through, the, through the cupboards. But he was our next door neighbor for, for a very long time. Patsy and Lanou were our neighbors across the... Uh, we The houses were built around a, a kind of a square cut into um, a hill. Um, so for a long time, we lived very much with people from Black Mountain. It was kind of a continuation. M.C. Richards very much wanted to start a weekend college. We didn't do that. It did not develop into uh, an avowedly specific educational place. It was very educational, sometimes much. Both Black Mountain and the place we formed were more educational than you could bear sometimes. I would say that was... That was their chief, because like, life's like that too. But because they were so open, you know, and honest in a way, uh, you were subject to a lot of uh, struggle with self, with other people, with philosophies uh, and things that didn't work, you know. Uh, and and you, that was part of your education. Is there anything that you didn't do at Black Mountain, that you look back now, wish maybe you had done? A class you didn't take, or a party you didn't participate in? Or? Not that comes to mind, you know, there's always some regrets of that sort, but no, not, not that I can think of. I participated in about everything I could. Uh, Joseph Alberts taught me to waltz. I remember him saying, the man leads. Uh, but he did teach me to waltz. And then uh, we had a a couple of years later, we had a waltzing contest in Ted Dreyer, young Ted Dreyer, the son of, of mm -hmm. older Ted Dreyer, and I won the waltzing contest. Um, so I, I, I had been brought up kind of a, a, willfully by my parents, uh, as though popular culture didn't exist in the United States. <laughs> we didn't listen to popular music, we didn't listen to the radio, and you know, uh, and that was their choice. I mean, we listened to classical music on the radio. So there were a lot, like I didn't know how to dance, even though, you know, everybody in my high school knew how, you know, of that kind of dancing. I had knew how to, I had taken part in modern dancing, but I had never um, actually danced. So I got to do uh, those things, you know, we would, on Saturday nights, we would run over through the mud from our dorms to the, to the dining room holding our shoes and wearing our long dresses. <laughs> there was a time when you uh, were involved with a women's magazine. Could you talk a little bit about that? I'm not sure what you're referring to. I was involved with Liberation magazine. Uh -huh. uh, I did the covers for many years, and uh, that was a uh, radical pacifist magazine. Dave Dellinger was one of its editors. A.J. Musty was a longtime uh, uh, pacifist activist, uh, was uh, on, on its editorial board. And uh, a community name called Glenn Gardner. I don't, it was in Glenn Gardner, New Jersey. It may have had a different name was where it was printed and where Dave Dellinger lived. And they were trying to have a communal life there too. And I used to, go, they were, we were close to them and I used to go down there. And I was able to work, it was a much larger printing press and all, but I was able to be very experimental about the covers. I did woodcuts, I did drawings. Uh, uh, one year I think I did almost all the covers. The first cover I did uh, was, uh, for an article that Paul Goodman wrote about when when Wilhelm Reich died, uh, and I had been interested in that, and he, they asked me to do the cover, and I did that. The next one that I remember doing was 
when a little group sailed a sailboat into the Pacific uh, to try to uh, bollocks up the uh, nuclear weapons test that was about to be held. Uh, I forget the name of that little ship, but I did a little sailboat. and I, I had a lot of freedom about what to do. And then when the war in Vietnam uh, was underway, I did a whole series of covers, uh, including that. I, I, I was a long time activist uh, uh, against war, against nuclear weapons, uh, and uh, I was able to express that in, on that magazine. Um, as for the, from the, the women's movement, I have been uh, active in. Uh, I took part in a uh, group called Women's Pentagon Action, which uh, there was no war going on. Uh, this would have been in the 80s, I believe. Uh, and. Uh, it was mostly on the East Coast, and we all, as a group, uh, went to Washington, D.C. We took, uh, we were lent large puppets by the Bread and Puppet uh, Theater, and we made our own march through Arlington Cemetery, and we tried to highlight women who had lost their lives uh, in uh, struggles uh, with, uh, with motherhood, with rape, uh, uh, elements that we felt were just uh, neglected and uh, also particularly to grieve for the and to resist the amount of money that and the amount of attention that was and now more than even then is being poured into war which did not seem to be a pursuit of, uh, of interests in family, children and education. So. I was arrested in that. Um, we blocked the steps of the Pentagon. We wove them. We wove them shut with ribbon. And <laughs> the police cut the ribbons <laughs> and we threw more ribbons up. It was, it was meant to be expressive of, uh, of uh, female interests uh, and uh, a way to make the protest. And the author Grace Paley wrote a uh, a wonderful statement. She took the ideas of everybody and she fashioned them into something called a unity statement. And a lot of us learned it by, a lot of it by heart and we sat on the steps and chanted it. Anyway, many of us got arrested and I ended up uh, spending, going back to <laughs> the South, to West Virginia uh, in chains, <laughs> in a bus, to the federal prison at Alderson where I stayed for a month. So I had a new educational experience since I obviously wasn't going to be there, you know, and I don't want to make light of, you know, what it would have felt like if I was going to be there for years uh, and if I were, I had been treated really badly, but uh, I, it, for a month it was remarkably uh, enlightening because as you get sent to prison, you know, you don't know about it, <laughs> and you still don't know about it if you're there as a white, uh, mm -hmm. middle-class uh, woman with lawyers and with the press eye on you, you know, but you, you do get much more idea about it, right? You've had quite a lot. <laughs> I'm still having it. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful that now, you know, that we, we really live a long time, right? Yeah, yeah. we can do lots of stuff. <laughs> yeah, but uh, let's, you know, just... Uh, Connect it back, you know. It's been a wonderful life, and between my parents and you know New York City and the Bronx and and then Black Mountain, I really uh, lucked out. <laughs> Thank you That's so not... much, Barry. You've been great. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow.